Thank you, Simon. And uh, do you hear me now? Well, good. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, all doctoral students. I think that is the finest invitation uh, one can have. Uh, and I'm also very happy to be here because, as I said to Simon, the Rachel Carson Center has this aura of being in an inspiring place, and I have never been here before, so it's, it's really a pleasure. Uh, I will start, I will talk uh, about this book that Simon mentioned. Uh, I have a copy here if someone is interested to take a look afterwards. Uh, but I took the opportunity to force myself to, to change uh, the entrance point a bit and we'll see if, if this makes sense to you. As a starting point, Sorry, like that. Industrialization transformed landscapes and society. When production conditions changed, many of these transformed landscapes and societies were left in a post-industrial situation with unemployment, redundant factories and infrastructures and polluted environments. Perhaps we can call them scarred grounds. If generalizing, I would say that there are three main categories of sites in this post-industrial situation. First, at some places, the industrial remains were left to ruination and decay, and at once visually romanticized and considered a disgrace for modern society. Second, at other places, especially those located close to water in the center of cities and towns, residents and developers turned industrial aesthetics into an attraction and commodity by reducing abandoned industrial sites for housing, schools, <coughs> restaurants and galleries. A third category which I have labelled undefined or liminal, brings together sites which are not really seen. Generally, they are difficult to visit, difficult to comprehend, and not considered important. These places are often post-industrial in the sense that production has stopped, but they may still house some ongoing activity, and by that appearing as liminal and unclear. Personally, I find these places the, most, the far most interesting. One way they are interesting, and this is the new take, is that they are challenging, they are challenging a linear and chronological understanding of time. And I will here today try to show you how. I will also suggest a way to conceptualize these other temporalities by using the metaphor of a scar as a way to articulate and live with a scarred ground. Let's begin with the general characteristics of a scar. What is it, and how can it be used metaphorically? A scar is the reminder, a trace of a wound. It is often ugly and stands for the pains of the past. Spontaneously, a scar is always understood as negative. However, some bodily wounds and scars are chosen self-inflicted or at least positively laden. You see here cesarean section operation scars, menser scars with this beautiful young guy to the left, um, and uh, body ornamentation, which I learned uh, about quite recently uh, through so-called scarification. Over here. Uh, a kind of prolonged practice. If you, if you get bored of your tattoo, you can go into scarification. Uh, all these carry different meanings and connotations, but they have one thing in common. They are in common. They are physical reminders of something of at least personal significance. <coughs> a scar can even be a hallmark for the veteran or the fictional hero. Uh, and uh, at my home, we have, no, this one. This is a scar that is really important uh, back in my home and has been for uh, many years. Harry Potter surviving the attack by Voldemort and the sign uh, that he did like did so. 
In a similar manner, scarred grounds, for example post-industrial landscapes, but it could also be other kinds of places, often convey ambiguous and complex pasts about injustice and fear, along with survival, resilience and courage. Translated into another societal area, the idea of wounds and scars has been employed by architects and artists dealing with reconstruction of memorial projects. The Swedish artist Jonas Stahlberg, for example, won the competition to design a public memorial commemorating the 2011 Utøya massacre in Norway. The general idea of Dahlberg's proposal was to create a wound or a cut in nature by taking away a slice of a narrow cape at Utøya. This three and a half meter void or artificial sound would make it impossible to reach the end of the cape. It would interrupt visitors' movement in order to, and I quote, acknowledge what is forever irreplaceable, end of quote. Uh, even though he won this competition, um, this memorial um, um, installation or, or this memorialization uh, has not happened yet because of, of uh, the conflict, since those living close by really don't want to have it there. Um, another example is the American architect Lebus Woods, who has designed several projects for places marked by different kinds of crisis. His best known proposals are for Sarajevo after the Balkan War, a project to combat Havana's deterioration after decades of an ongoing trade embargo, and from San, for San Francisco after the 1989 earthquake. His overall approach in these three places is termed radical reconstruction, emanating from proposals called scabs, tissues, and scars. In many ways, the architecture resembles organic texture and form. It interplays with existing, damaged buildings and sites by means of contrast, mirroring, and outgrowth. Wood denotes a scab, and I quote, a first layer of reconstruction, shielding an exposed interior space or void, protecting it during its transformation. End of quote. A scar, he says, and I quote again, a deeper level of reconstruction that fuses the new and the old, a mark of pride and honor, both for what has been lost and what has been gained. It cannot be erased. To accept a scar is to accept existence. End of quote. Thus, basically, a scar tells about important and most often ambiguous pasts. Important because the event causing the wound, and later the scar, was of such a scale that it didn't heal into disappearance, but left a mark that will never go away. And ambiguous because of its potential to combine the past, the pains of the past, with the strength of endurance, and sometimes also the beauty of experience. The story of a scar, therefore, never concerns indifference. To present the first challenging temporality, I will now elaborate on another aspect of the scar, namely how it relates to simultaneity, and I will use the palimpsest as a contrasting illustration. A palimpsest, as you probably know, is a handwritten manuscript on parchment or papyrus on which one text has been scraped away and replaced by a new one. This recycling practice of antiquity and the Middle Ages was often used repeatedly in order to mark, um, make use of the valuable parchment, even though it was sometimes possible to discern the erased text behind the new edition. In postmodern contexts, the word has been used metaphorically to describe the different layers of significance that make up history and heritage. New layers are continuously added as time goes by, like new text inscribed on a scraped clean parchment. However, this metaphorical use of the palimpsest is misleading if one wishes to emphasize the interconnectedness the linked relevance between the different layers. If we believe that history and heritage consists of a multitude of parallel or successive stories and perspectives, all contributing to one another and to the overall picture, the palimpsest is a poor choice of a metaphor, since the palimpsest in its original sense implies that new texts are added without regard or connection to those previously erased. And thus, the end result is a picture made up of fragments and additions without any mutuality 
or interrelated content. A scar, on the other hand, puts emphasis on the interconnected and sometimes simultaneously existing meanings. When a wound is healing into a scar, the scar itself could be understood as dead, non-sensory skin, where the normal skin layers have been replaced by a dense new scar tissue. But nevertheless, it forms a part of the living body. It is organic and created on the basis of past significances and tangled with present standpoints. Therefore, in a metaphorical use, the scar also offers a way to overcome the many dichotomies of change, before and after, winners and losers, progress and decline, and create integrality and simultaneity instead. The scar is not a palimpsest. Now, take a, let us take a look at the way in which the liminal and undefined post-industrial places presents us with the temporal understanding emanating from this idea of organic integration and simultaneity. When I visited this steelworks in Trusovoy in the Ural Mountains in Russia, uh, more than 10 years ago now. One uh, of the top attractions for our group of industrial heritage scholars uh, was the so-called Bessemer converter. Uh, when you see this picture, you have to imagine that I'm standing in a group of, I don't know, 70 uh, white-hatted uh, scholars all photographing the same thing. Uh, since most of these converters were taken out of use half a century ago and turned into museum objects. What is actually past and what is present in this place? The lived landscape of the steelworks and the viewed exotified landscape were here blurred in a way that I hadn't really experienced before. Sociologist John Arry distinguishes between land as, place, as places based in the everyday, in production of goods and in understanding of home. While landscape, in his view, is the same piece of land, also full of meaning, albeit with other connection, connotations. Ari has showed how lands were turned into landscapes, into places of visual desire and emotion, of travel and new encounters. His examples are gleaned primarily from the agrarian countryside in the early 20th century that became postcarded through the emergence of a tourist gaze with the technology of photography in a, playing a key role. I would argue that a similar process has also turned the industrial land of home and production into post-industrial landscapes defined by a touristic visual experience of reuse or abandonment, rust and growing vegetation. However, while Ari asserts that the transformation from land to landscape is irreversible, that is, two separate parts in a chronological temporality, I propose that a scar metaphor can indeed form a reconnection between the two, between land and landscape. The scar might be the result of this transformation, but it's also a new entity, providing integration between different stories and significances. Hence, the experiences and perceptions of land and landscape can exist at the same time, at the same physical spot, but the constitutions differ and one of them is dominant, either the land or the landscape. The scar is, is a possibility to acknowledge the abiding meanings of land within an understanding dominated by landscape. People living in the land who consider it their home probably know whether it has become postcarded into a landscape by other people and vice versa. People comprehending a place mainly through the tourist's case can include an understanding of a still existing land. They may ex exist simultaneously. Thus, the first temporality I want to highlight here today is the possible and also, I would say, probable uh, simultaneity of different lived realities on the same physical grounds with simultaneous yet interconnected significances. To describe the second way in which I think the liminal and undefined scarred grounds provide us with, with a challenging temporality, I will tell a bit about how the scar metaphor relates to process, which later will lead us to a prospective approach. 
I think it's easy uh, to see how the scar puts emphasis on process. The course of healing from wound to scar is however not linear nor automatic, non-deterministic you could say. Instead, as in individual psychological healing, the process might, may be cyclical, can happen in stages and even demand active work. It brings difficult pasts to the fore as, it, as often as it leads away from them, and old wounds may reopen. Thus, while a scar bears the potential capacity to heal, recover and reconcile, this is not a self-evident outcome especially since the metaphorical scar applies to processes of healing in the social, cultural and political spheres rather than the biological one. Uh, these pictures show how the lo local municipality uh, envisions the future of the place where the closed down Bashebek nuclear power plant is located. Uh, so this is how it looks today and this is their view of, of a first step when everything is taken away uh, and uh, a, a safe green lawn is established and then they want to build the Bashebek seaside resort on the same place. Uh, and this might be uh, understood as a joke but it's actually not. Uh, it's, it is a vision of healing or a vision of concealing the nuclear activities of the past. That's an issue one can think of. Furthermore, the score is not only a noun, but also a verb, implying a process or action taken. We can scar and become scarred, and scarring can take place. There is somebody behind the existence of a scar. Responsibility and choices are involved, and in the scarring process, the open, one, the open wound turns into a scab on its way to finally become a scar. The intermediate stage of a scab signifies a situation of undefined shapes and unsettled meanings, a liminal condition. While the scar often remains ambiguous, the scab is even more open to interpretation in a multitude of ways. Here, struggles over hierarchies of significance become particularly overt, overt and discernible. Some wounds remain as, scar, uh, remain as scabs for a long time because there is no room for healing and recovery. What about this future-oriented process with hope and action, but also with uncertain power relations if put into metaphorical use? The temporality of a perspective approach has, in my version at least, its roots in ecological research of abandoned urban and industrial scarred grounds and the so-called industrial nature. When an industrial site is abandoned, so-called rural species begin to colonize the left-behind structures. Rural, as many of you perhaps know, is a term describing both the type of ground and the vegetation growing there. The word has its origin in Latin, ruderalis and rudus, meaning rubble, like gravel and broken bricks. And typical locations for rural species are roadsides, ruins, and other leftover or in-between spaces. The concept is also used more generally to describe any wasteland, such that rural species are sometimes equated with weed. Ruderals are usually pioneers, fast-growing plants that rapidly complete their life cycles and often produce a great number of seeds. They typically dominate a disturbed area for a few years before gradually losing out in competition with other species. Some ecologists call this industrial nature. From the perspective of ecology, there is a favoring of nature that is regarded original or genuine in the sense of being most natural which is echoing heritage understandings of favoring the authentic and original. Ecologist Ingo Kovarik suggests that there are two scientific approaches to naturalness, one retrospective and one prospective. The retrospective approach traditionally dominates as it favors conservation of pristine, pristine ecosystems, that is, an idealized picture of an original landscape. The prospective approach is less widespread and focuses instead on natural capacity for process. And when the prospective approach is applied, one may reach the perhaps surprising conclusion that among ecosystems in a city, 
the industrial nature or urban industrial woodlands, as Kovare calls them, are the most natural ones. It is even possible to be conceptualized as a new wilderness. While the both spontaneous and planned overgrowing of abandoned industrial sites is a fascinating phenomenon in itself, it has also bearings on how we more generally can think of the relation between past, present and future. I think the prospective approach of seeing industrial nature as a new wilderness encourages us to try what happens if we play down the commonly used retrospective memory, that is, to regard history and heritage as something originally and intrinsically authentic. But rather apply a prospective approach also here. A prospective memory suggests an unfolding and ongoing relationship between past, present and future. And seductively enough, resonates very well with the prospective approach to naturalness, in which the capacity for process is a key feature. So here, what do you say? Uh, do you think this arts project to make wall plates with motifs of nuclear power plant landscapes and the accompanying motto of the artists, and now forgive me my pronunciation, Denkmäler des Irrtums, Hoffnung von gestern, Folklore von morgen. If this is an example of a prospective approach to memory. Uh, and I have to, here is a close up, one of the plates. To change viewpoint like this, to change temporality in a way, might however cause negative reactions, since from a traditional standpoint, point, the focus on the capacity of scarred grounds to contribute to a social and material healing process instead of what is the preset authentic heritage, in this case the story of nuclear power, can be as provocative as to put the new wilderness of industrial nature um, with the highest growing capacity alongside with the pristine old wilderness. Thus, the second temporality I want to highlight is the prospective approach, a focus of becoming. If choosing this temporality as a point of departure, the valuation of different scarred ground also changes. The attention to process and becoming process uh, and becoming of living with a scar is certainly also more difficult since it implies that the significance of an event are not once and for all defined. This also leads me to my conclusions. Sorry. A final characteristic of a scar that I want to emphasize is how it might be chafing and itching. In a metaphorical use, this chafing is a sign that here is something not settled, not entirely told about. And this is a key characteristic, I think. For both the temporalities I have de been describing, the simultaneity of different lived realities on the same physical ground, and the prospective approach with a focus on becoming and capacity for process, the chafing and itching of the scar is critical. This is because of the unavoidable power relations involved in the definitions and understandings of the scarred ground. If we, for example, take an undefined, if we take an undefined and liminal place, it might quickly change into a ruined or reused site, where it still might be called scarred ground, but where the existing lived realities are fewer and the capacity for process more limited. With this, I am not saying that we should aim for as many undefined places as possible, or that ambiguity is always an inherently good and li or liberating, but rather, as human geographer Shiro Krupa pointed out, that ambiguity is what must be explored to contest routinized recitation of evidence and established truth. The itching of a scar can therefore be seen as a crucial narrative potential, a potential that is both a possibility and a promise. If paying attention to this itching, we will get a tool to question power relations. All stories are not equally true or equally important. And therefore, I believe we have a responsibility to always search for legitimate politics of memory in the ongoing transformations of landscapes and society. Before ending, I would uh, just tell that I'm currently working on nuclear fish uh, as something that has to be 
ecologically monitored due to massive use of uh, cooling water in the production process and as a cultural practice in different ways. So afterwards, if any of you have any ideas or references to this fascinating area of nuclear fish, I'm very happy to hear them later. For now, and with this picture of Allan's Pond, um, a beautiful site built for dumping low-level radioactive mud, I would like to encourage you to look for, articulate and embrace the ambiguity, the simultaneity and the prospective approach of places you meet, be it industrial, post-industrial or other kinds of scarred grounds. Thank you. <laughs>